I'm Roger Berkowitz, and welcome to the next installment of the Hannah Arendt Center Reading Group. Today, we're reading Hannah Arendt's essay, The Crisis in Education. This is an essay that she originally published in German uh, and was then translated and republished in her book, Between Past and Future, a book which we will be reading um, over the next couple sessions of, of the reading group. And uh, this book in general is a collection of essays that I think is some of her best and most important writing. So I'm very much looking forward to, to reading it with you, including this essay. The essay is hard. Um, it's, it's a bit convoluted. It begins with this idea of the crisis of education. And one of the um, uh, tricky parts of the essay is that nowhere does Hannah Arendt ever say, this is the crisis of education. Um, or, and so we have to think, well, what is the crisis in education? And um, there are a couple, but the overriding crisis, the one that um, really does drive her writing in this book, is uh, the crisis in authority. Now, we will discuss that more when we read her essay, What is Authority?, which is about the crisis in authority. Mm -hmm. But uh, we need to take seriously what she means by that crisis in authority. It will come up throughout the book, the essay. And uh, it's helpful, I think, to begin at the end on page 191 uh, on the um, second to last page of the essay, where she uh, connects the crisis of education explicitly to the crisis in authority. So she writes at the bottom of 191, the problem of education in the modern world lies in the fact that by its very nature, it cannot forego either authority or tradition and yet must proceed in a world that is neither structured by authority nor held together by tradition. The point here is that uh, the crisis of authority means that tradition no longer uh, is authoritative for us. Um, we live in a world in which uh, there are no unquestioned authorities. We always, as free, rational, autonomous beings, we always want to know what is the justification for any uh, rule or or, or 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 claim upon our obedience, and we don't take that as simply an authority. And the loss of the authority is a problem for education. Why? Um, that means, however, that not just teachers and educators, but all of us, insofar as we live in one world together with our children and with young people, must take toward them an attitude radically different from the one we take toward one another. We must decisively divorce the realm of education from the others, most of all from the realm of public political life, in order to apply to it alone a concept of authority and an attitude towards the past which are appropriate to it, but have no general validity and must not claim a general validity in the world of grown-ups. The point here is that education needs authority. In education, we teach young people, we teach children. Um, and yet we live in a world, we have to reconcile us, ourselves to the fact that the political and public worlds we live in uh, have lost authority. And yet, if we are to educate our children, our young people, somehow we're going to have to separate, divorce the realm of education from the public worlds and find authority even in a world without authority, at least in the world of education. And that is the background for much of this essay and her attempts to think through the crisis in education. Um, let's go back to the beginning and, and follow our, our usual approach of trying to read a few quotes to, 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 to understand this book. She begins with what she calls the general crisis that has overtaken the modern world uh, everywhere. Um, she says it takes different forms in different places, but in, in, in large measure, this is the crisis of authority. Um, and she says in America, the crisis of authority um, has an appearance um, in education. Um, she says that, quote, at the bottom of 171, in America, as a matter of fact, education plays a different and politically incomparably more important role than in other countries. And the reason for this uh, is that uh, in America, there's two reasons she offers. In America, one, we have immigrants and new people constantly coming into the country. 
and education is where they learn things like English or American, and they also learn uh, what it means to be an American in some shape or form in this idea of a melting pot. And uh, while adults who come to the country often don't uh, melt into the American way so easily, the view is that education has played an important role in that. And the second uh, reason that education is important in America is that America is a country based in the idea of uh, a new political revolution, the idea that we can um, remake our world and make it better. And this idea of the novus ordu seculorum, a new order of the world, and education uh, has a political function that it shares um, with all utopian political uh, thinking, uh, that um, education becomes an instrument of politics and thus a political activity where we can make a better world. But it's this political aspect of education in America that for Arendt is dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous because for her, education needs to be kept separate from politics. And so on pages 173 to 4, we see uh, her making this claim clearly. It's an important claim in all of her writing. So at the bottom of 173, she writes, education can play no part in politics because in politics, we always have to deal with those who are already educated. This is a fundamental Arendtian claim that in the political public world, we deal with adults. Adults are plural. They're different. They've been educated and they have their opinions. And if their opinions differ from us, we have to learn how to deal with them. We don't educate them. That's called brainwashing. And so she continues, whoever wants to educate adults to teach them that their opinions should actually be our opinions, really wants to act as their guardian and pre prevent them from political activity. The point is that free educated adults should not be educated politically. They should be engaged in conversation and persuasion. And so for her, um, this American uh, idea of political education uh, risks being dangerous. There's actually a third uh, important um, uh, feature of American education that uh, is, is at issue here, and that is the idea of equality, uh, which she uh, praises greatly uh, in, in American education. And yet she says that there's no doubt, this is on page 177, um, it is obvious that such an equalization, namely an equalization of ideas and an equalization of the teacher and the student, it is obvious that such an equalization can actually be accomplished only at the cost of the teacher's authority and at the expense of the gifted among the students. However, it is equally obvious, at least to anyone who has ever come in contact with the American educational system, that this difficulty, rooted in the political attitude of the country, also has great advantages not simply of a human kind, but educationally speaking as well. In any case, these general factors cannot explain the crisis. So the, uh, the political idea of a revolutionary political education, the American idea of equality, and the American idea of education as a melting pot um, all contribute to the American version of the crisis of education. Um, but uh, that's not what she's really writing about. What she wants to know is, um, what is this crisis in education? And she says that um, there have been three um, basic assumptions. This is now what part two of the essay is about, um, which lead us to this crisis. And uh, the first assumption is that the child is free from adult authority and thus left to the power of their peers. This is what she talks about on page 177 to 178. The second basic assumption is that the um, teachers are emancipated from content and curricula and learn how to teach instead of learning a subject. And this is part of her critique of Americans' idea of uh, masters in teaching, uh, where teachers, in order to teach, don't need to learn math or history or literature. They need to learn how to teach. And for her, this is... Uh, indicative of the loss of authority. The teachers don't gain their authority from knowing a discipline, but from having some 
skill and mastering of teaching. And the third uh, presupposition uh, of the crisis of education is that you can only know what you do yourself. Um, and thus we substitute doing for learning. Um, she says on 179, the reason that no importance was attached to the teachers of mastering his own subject was the wish to compel him to the exercise of the continuous activity of learning so that he would not, as they said, pass on dead knowledge, but instead would constantly demonstrate how it is produced. So the idea is here, it's not important what I teach you, but that I teach you how to learn, which is a great idea. We do want to teach students how to learn, but it stands in opposition to the idea that we also actually have something to teach you. And this um, transformation from having something to teach you to the process of learning is for her indicative of these three presumptions, all touched, all connected to the loss of authority um, that uh, lead to this crisis in education. Um, all of which raises for her two questions, uh, which she articulates on page 181. Uh, the first is, what is the essence of education, which she's going to discuss in part three? And what is the true reason for the abandonment of common sense in education? Um, which she'll talk about in, in part four. Common sense in education is for her this idea that we know um, what we are teaching and it's connected to the idea of authority. Um, so in part three, which is in many ways the heart of the essay, um, Arendt asks, um, what is education? And uh, her answer, is in a sense that education is connected to a double aspect. Um, and that double aspect uh, is that on the one hand, education is about the world, and on the other hand, education is about life. And so let's, let's look at this quote on page 182. Thus the child, the subject of education, has for the educator a double aspect. He is new in a world that is strange to him, and he is in process of becoming. He is a new human being, and he is a becoming human being. This double aspect is by no means self-evident, and it does not apply to the animal forms of life. It corresponds to a double relationship, the relationship to the world on the one hand, and to life on the other. Education is double. On the one hand, when we educate a young person, we have to protect them as a living being, just like a dog would protect their puppy. And uh, in doing so, we have to protect them from the dangers and difficulties of the world. Um, and yet, she says, the other aspect, which is specifically human, is that we have to protect the world from uh, the children. Um, so on page 182, a little bit lower, she says, human parents, however, have not only summoned their children into life through conception and birth, they have simultaneously introduced them into a world. In education, they assume responsibility for both, for the life and development of the child and for the continuance of the world. These two responsibilities do not by any means coincide. They may indeed come into conflict with one another. And so part of education is protecting the life of the child, but part of it is protecting the world, the humanly built world. And this is, I think, what is unique in Arendt's approach to education. And it leads to her understanding that um, the world, in order to protect the world from the new, education must in some sense be conservative. Um, and so she writes on page 188, um, and here is where she really develops this idea at the bottom of the page. To avoid misunderstanding, it seems to me that conservatism, in the sense of conservation, is of the essence of the educational activity, whose task is always to cherish and protect something, the child against the world, the world against the child the new against the old, the old against the new. 
So education is about protecting both sides, the child life against the world, but also the world against the onslaught of life and the new. And she continues, even the comprehensive responsibility for the world that is thereby assumed implies, of course, a conservative attitude, namely to conserve what is the world as it exists that the child is born into. But she continues again, but this conservative attitude holds good only for the realm of education, or rather for the relations between grown-ups and children, and not for the realm of politics where we act among and with adults and equals. In politics, this conservative attitude can only lead to destruction because the world in gross and in detail is irrevocably delivered up to the ruin of time unless human beings are determined to intervene to alter and to create new worlds. Conservatism in politics will lead to the destruction of society and civilization because civilizations evolve and change, right? But she says, to preserve the world, this is again further down on, on 189, uh, to preserve the world against the mortality of its creators and inhabitants, it must be constantly set right anew. The problem is simply to educate in such a way that a setting right remains actually possible, even though it can, of course, never be assured. To preserve the world against the morality and the mortality of its creators, she says. The word for preserve is erhalten. I'm sorry, the word to preserve here is im seinhalten, um, which means to hold or to keep in a state of being. We need to hold and preserve and keep in a state of being the world um, that against the mortality of its creators, because they will die and the inhabitants, it must be constantly set right anew. The problem, she says, is to educate in such a way that such a setting right remains possible. And then a little further down, she says, exactly for the sake of what is new and revolutionary in every child, education must be conservative. It must preserve. And here the word for preserve is bevaren. It must preserve to hold in trust this newness and introduce it as a new thing into an old world which, however revolutionary its actions may be, is always from the standpoint of the next generation, superannuated and close to destruction. This is to me the, the core of Arendt's thinking about education, that it is conservative, it preserves the old world, and it is revolutionary. It allows and holds in trust the newness, the idea that in every world there will be upendings, revolutions, transformations, changes, and that however revolutionary the actions and changes may be, it is always from the standpoint of the next generation, superannuated, old. And so education is this mix of the conservative and revolutionary, the holding on to and teaching what is with authority, introducing new people into a world that is already exists and teaching them that part of what already exists the world they're born into is a world that will change and it is their responsibility to learn how to change it not ours to teach them how to change it and then we that brings us to part four which is the part about authority and she starts part four with this quote the real difficulty in modern education lies in the fact that despite all the fashionable talk about a new conservatism, this is against progressive education, right? Even that minimum of conservation and the conserving attitude without which education is simply not possible is in our time extraordinarily hard to achieve. There are good reasons for this. The crisis of authority in education is most closely connected with the crisis of tradition. That is, with the crisis in our attitude towards the realm of the past. And this brings us full circle to where I started. And the point is that education needs to be able to teach people to love the world. 
We need to take responsibility as educators and parents to say to students, we love, here's the world you were born into. There are problems, there are disasters, there are injustices, and we should confront those and understand it. But we also have to learn to love it. We have to learn what's great in it without in any way denying um, its tragedies, injustices, and disasters. And it's this attempt to uh, love the world and mix that love with thus an insistence that the students learn it, but in teaching them the world in a conservative way, not in any way retard or reject their needs and desires as new people to change that world. And that's that mix of conservative and revolutionary. And thus on the last page of the essay, she writes, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it. And by the same token, save it from that ruin, which except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and young, would be inevitable. We have to accept responsibility for the world if we love it. And that means assume the responsibility to teach others the world as it is, the world of history and tradition, even though we know that that world of tradition and history is falling apart and is no longer uh, valid in politics. And at the same time, um, make possible the renewal of, that the young will bring to the world. This is the challenge, um, as Arendt understands it, of, of education. And um, it is the challenge that the crisis of education makes palpable and opens the possibility for us to enter so long as we see it clearly. I look forward to discussing the essay with you in our next group. Thank you very much.